we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree not known, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Through the unknown, unremembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. Congo, the very word conjures a sense of foreboding, a vast jungle and impenetrable wilderness. The Congo River is the biggest in the world after the Amazon. The outboards are propelling our dugout pirogues for seven days and nights, 1,500 kilometres into Conrad's heart of darkness. We are journeying down a time tunnel Funneling back towards the dawn of humanity, feels like to us, where our goal at the end of the river is to find our closest and rarest cousin, the peace-loving great ape called the Bonobo. For me, this journey really commenced 16 years ago when I came across a book on the human condition by the biologist Jeremy Griffith. It asked some simple but profound questions. How did we acquire our sense of morality? Where do our capacities for love and idealism come from? The answer may be that humanity once lived in a peaceful existence such as bonobos do today. I determined to witness for myself their remarkable behaviour, but for the next 10 years the Congo was plunged into a war that claimed the lives of 4 million people and caught the bonobos in the crossfire. Only now the danger has subsided enough to allow me and a couple of friends to make this expedition to finally meet the bonobos in the wild and to see what we can do to help the local people who share their habitat. We were very lucky to have Landreen doing our cooking. She was uh, 19 and a student at a local uh, university. Michael Hurley is the executive director for the Bonobo Conservation Initiative in Washington, D.C. has a very natural flair for making things There's happen. There's no refrigeration up and down the river. So smoked fish, just as would smoke meat, bush meat, is the preferred method for, uh, for keeping food. Phil Strickland is a senior counsel, a barrister on my floor in Sydney. He came along and had a special interest in setting up a medical clinic. Dr. Luke Bennett, who I met trekking to see the mountain gorillas in Uganda. And he came along in part also as a consultant for the medical clinic. A very sizable crocodile, so we've been told by our intrepid leader here, Mike, slipped into the river. But we're feeling safe because you've got a quite a big sharp knife. Western long snouted crocodile though. Long snouted crocodiles, which like the Australian freshie, are pretty, pretty harmless. Yeah. By all reports. It can be big, but. I practice as a barrister, that's my career. I try to balance that with striving to ensure the survival of bonobos. It's quite a paradox to think that, that in the midst of this, almost a black hole of human tragedy, which has seen so much warfare and suffering and, and death, disease, in the midst of all this human chaos, is one of the most peaceful, gregarious and loving of animals. And that this creature, this bonobo, happens to be the closest living animal to humanity, makes their existence in this dark realm of human agony all the more of an improbable oasis of light. Now, as you see, the logging's a lot more extensive than it was last year and the year before earlier. Three years ago, three and a half years ago, pristine forest just as in other segments of the river. Now, we've heard that they're just cutting right deep into the forest. We don't know how far and uh, it might not be prudent for us to stop and walk in and ask them questions. People like to eat them. I say, yeah. Say, but. Do you say, like, under cette espèce? Ça, c'est une famille de singes. Une famille, it's a monkey? De singes. We find this little bonobo. We had its hand caught in a snare. Unfortunately, the hand had to be amputated. 
But we arranged for her passage to a sanctuary where a similar orphan bonobos, who are victims of the bush meat trade, can find some health and restoration. <laughs> In this sanctuary, we were able to see bonobo behaviour up close and personal. The remarkable capacity they have for nurturing their young, the tendency to walk upright, as well as the use of tools, rocks and sticks. The use of sexual pleasure. It seems, like, it seems like there's just absolutely no competition sexually in bonobo society. They're more than happy to share partners. The only taboos are, are incest taboos. Even the juveniles partake in bonobo sexual behaviour. Because the females are so promiscuous, there's no jealousy amongst the males of the sexual opportunity. Well, it's certainly very different to, to the chimpanzee structure. The chimpanzees uh, will fight over mating rights of the females. But bonobos seem to have moved past that altogether. And uh, the males aren't so fussed about having their, their progeny passed on. They're having sex with the females all day long anyway. The reason bonobo males have such large testicles, what has developed has been termed by some biologists as sperm wars in the bonobo males, where um, the competition takes place more inside the womb, the female, rather than next, in an exterior fashion. So it's quite a unique adaption they've made for um, trying to ensure that their genes get passed on but not in a way that, that is, uh, involves divisive aggression between the males which could lead potentially to a dis disintegration of the bonobo society. <laughs> In the middle of nowhere we came across the Ketsi, this, this uh, series of barges lashed together and being shunted upstream by a diesel motor and on board was just a flotilla of um, markets and things on top. Probably, probably about three to five hundred at least Congolese in the middle of the, the depths of the river. No, 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 not that way, surely not. This is mad. Really, go, go get on your <sighs> They're all family wedge back here. Looking to be crushed to death. Look at me. Push, go. Down. <sighs> Jam between two solid logs in a tight little jam.
We've finally arrived at Kokolo Puri. What a welcome from these villagers over here. Mbote! This is what we've come here for. Just trekked for a couple of kilometres into the jungle and just caught the bonobos as they're waking up. It's about 7.30 in the morning. So hard to film them because they're set against the light high in the dark canopy. So it's incredibly hard to film apart from the fact that they're black as well. The infants are just soaked in love from the first moment they're born, they're tended to not just by their own mothers, but also by the other females in the group, but in a very human-like way, just displaying intense affection. It's the essence of bonobo society. It really is what forms a foundation for their gregariousness and their peaceful tendency. And what's also curious is that they're looking back at us with a, what feels like an equal measure of awareness. For me personally, having thought about these animals and dreamt about coming here for the last 15 years, to finally be here, it's worth every little bit of the epic journey up the river that it's taken to, to be here. It's just incredibly special. Seeing the bonobos confirmed to me what I'd learned and read about them, both through Jeremy Griffith's work, plus all the, the studies I'd made of, of my own accord of other researchers in the bonobo region. The bonobos do de demonstrate a remarkable capacity to have sex in all different combination situations. <laughs> Rubbing vulvas against each other for the females, it often seems they do it not just to ease tension and conflict in their society, but as a way of just of savouring the enjoyment and the pleasure of it. But I think also because the bonobo society is matriarchal, in other words, the, the females has the, the right of veto over situations, and the males will remain deferential to their mothers for their entire life. And perhaps this also has some ramifications for the dynamic sexually in the species. The fact that bonobos have such a food-rich environment means that they don't really have to compete over the food. They don't have to travel vast distances and break up from each other to get the food that they need. Here we have some once bitten bonobo ammunition. <laughs> They're uh, sort of hailing the uh, fruit down on us at the moment, it's actually pretty funny. All very good natured. That's correct. <laughs> their environment and their habitat is largely free of predators. There are leopards, who are the, historically the main predator, and more recently man. Obviously man now is, a, is the foremost threat to their existence. At uh, 8 or 8.39 they will uh, come down. There's a local chief in the Kokolo Puri region called Albert Locasola. His presence in this region is, has been instrumental in helping the local people uh, come to understand the significance of bonobo conservation to them and for the bonobos themselves for their own sakes. The bonobos are the most endangered of all the great apes, more so than orangutans, gorillas and chimpanzees. There may be as few as five to 15,000 left. We're not really sure because they're so remote so hard to do a consensus on their population. But unless efforts are taken immediately to secure uh, their habitat, 
not just their habitat, but the local people's interest in conserving their habitat and the bonobos themselves, then the bonobos may, may well disappear in our lifetime. We really were profoundly impacted with that sense that um, these bonobos are really enjoying a cooperative and peaceful way of life that perhaps we have lost access to. If you try to walk in and impose yourself on any culture or on any local people and for the sake of saving an animal that lives in their midst, you'd probably be laughed out and I'll never take you seriously or what's more, they'll, they'll never take an interest in pursuing your conservation message whatsoever. But as the Bonobo Conservation Initiative is trying to do, if you can get in there and foster some grass, roots, incentives for the local people to take an interest in conserving the bonobos and preserving the habitat, so that they can see that there's some mutual benefit to be obtained, such as health clinics and medical clinics. The local people will take a sustained and active interest in looking after bonobos. All the infrastructure in the, in the Kogalopari region has been so devastated to the wars that there's no vehicles left up there anymore. But we managed to get by barge up river, a second-hand land cruiser, and it was marvellous to see it hurtling down the, the main thoroughfares of the villages. The Bonobo Conservation Initi Initiative slogan says, help the bonobo so that the bonobo may help you. And the community, to our observation, certainly seem to be getting that message over there. While we're setting up the medical clinic, we want to be involved with the people on a very personal level. Say des belles places du monde que nous avons jamais vues. You can get those qualifications to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, I think that's that would be good. That would be good. Jack, hey. Having been fortunate enough to visit the bonobos in the wild, it really only just confirms again for me how important and significant that Jeremy's ideas are. I think it's true that unless we have the key psychological tools to understand ourselves and our own origins and context on the planet, we're never going to really mature as a species. No, 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 not that way. Surely not. Who will come here, ma? Who will come here, ma? Ah, the blob, the blob. That's a crazy move. The same place. C'est la même place